This is the third of the five major discourses recorded in the book of Matthew. We already saw the Sermon of the Ma- on the Mount and the Sending of the Twelve in chapter 10. And here we come to Jesus' discourse in parables. Chapter 12 preceding it was a battle of wits between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees. His fame is spreading and going throughout all the land, but so also is the opposition to him. The environment is becoming less conducive to him freely sharing the gospel and the good news. But fortunately, not all is lost. The kingdom of heaven is still pressing forward, transforming lives, much as it is today. Even as the environment changes in our local society, the kingdom of God is still pressing forward, which should encourage us in our modern times as well. And Jesus illustrates for us how this is happening, the mounting opposition, but also, you know, the kingdom of God still going forward in this transition from preaching openly to the form of parables. Let let us see what we mean beginning in verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds were gathered to him, so that, so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood at the beach. <laughs> this location, by the way, that he was at was a natural amphitheater. Uh, going, going out on the boat and facing them would amplify his voice. So even though there were great crowds of people, everyone would be able to hear Jesus crystal clear in that location just because of the way that area was set up. <laughs> you know, I find it fascinating that even as recently as when this church was originally founded, if you didn't have a strong voice, you couldn't be a preacher because you, your voice had to carry to the back of the room. I mean, so back in the day when these churches were founded without these amplification systems, people actually sat in the front row by choice, because that was how you heard it. Uh, Aren't we blessed to live in a world without such a limitation, right? I mean, even at our, our last outreach that we had here, our community outreaches that we do here on the front lawn, no, we from the speakers we had set up just beyond these walls, you could hear us preaching the gospel clearly down at the train station, word for word. What a time to be alive, church, right? So it says here then, then Jesus sat down. As preachers used to sit in the first century, that was their custom. Um, much like standing behind a pulpit or a lectern is today, a symbol of I'm about to teach, it was the same way back then for when you sat down. Uh, and he taught them this beloved parable where in verse 3 that he said, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky soil where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, but since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun arose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seed fell among good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. (laughs) Now, we're going to spend... Next week, really unpacking this parable, because I, I want to set it up correctly, and I do not want to rush through something that deserves all of our time and attention. But let's just say where, how it ends, where it says, he who has ears, let him hear, has strong implications for how we understand the parable that was spoken to us. And it implies that these beautiful truths that we're going to be unpacking for the next couple of weeks as we go through all of these parables, will not be heard by all. We get a hint of what I'm talking about in verse 10, where we're going to spend a little bit more time, where he said, Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? A good question. Come to think of it, what is a parable? I mean, that, that's a word that we really only hear in church, don't we? 
To, to this day, if you start by Googling it, you will see that even the most secular resources cite Jesus as the greatest parable teller of all time. They all link back to him. And there are not too many other famous, well-known parables. So what is it? Well, the word parable comes from two Greek words. It, it conveys the idea of something being thrown alongside something else for the sake of a comparison. It's a comparative example, if you will. It is, furthermore, it is a short, pithy story meant to be spoken and heard that contains a memorable truth. That's kind of a more dictionary definition. A short, pithy story meant to be spoken and heard that conveys a memorable truth. Now, that's different than allegories, which are often confused with parables, but are not the same. An allegory is a longer story, usually written down, and every aspect of the story may contain truths that you can apply to your life. I mean, you immediately think of a wonderful book like Pilgrim's Progress, if you've ever read that book. That's a great Christian allegory. Or the Chronicles of Narnia, another great Christian allegory where it's a long written story with so many truths that you can unpack and apply to your life. And again, they are long, they are designed to be read, and they convey many points. Contrast that to a parable that is short, uh, intent, and while they can be written, they're intended to be spoken and, most importantly, convey one main point, not a bunch of different points. Now, John, why on earth are you talking so long about this? This is not a sixth grade English class. Why are you wasting my time this morning? <laughs> Did I hear some of you guys? <laughs> but Look, it, it's because if you treat, it's so important to understand, if you treat a parable like an allegory, you make the Bible say things it doesn't say. And it's very important to understand that as we open up these parables together. So in other words, just to kind of take an example from the parable of the sower, it is not wise to look at this parable and start discussing, well, well, you know, what? how could the soil have been prepared differently? Could they have tilled the ground better to make it better suitable for these seeds? Or perhaps what seed does thrive in rocky soil? And I'm sure you guys could find that online if you looked for it, but that's not the point of this passage. That's, my, that's where I'm getting at here. You know, Jesus is taking a common first century Jewish understanding of planting for the sake of a harvest and finding commonality with the kingdom of God. Now, no doubt these parables will have many personal applications for our lives. There's an infinite number of personal applications we can make that applies to each one of us as individuals. But we ought not ask, what does this parable mean to me? We have to start by asking, what does this parable mean? And then we can start asking, well, what does that imply for me? That's how to correctly approach a text like this. So let's discover more about these parables in verse 11, where he goes on and says, And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given and will have an abundance. But the one who has not, even what he has, will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. You know, it begins by Jesus saying, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. A better word for secrets is mystery. Because secret implies, you know, oh, hush, hush about this. This isn't meant to be known. But a mystery in the Bible means something actually quite different. When you see the word mystery in the Bible, it refers to something that was concealed earlier on, but has now been revealed. That's what that word means. So some of the newer translations are starting to put mystery in this verse. 
And um, so it, it's, it's not a riddle that needs to be solved. It's something that was concealed that has now been revealed. Colossians 1.27 speaks of the mystery of Christ in us. Ephesians 3 speaks about how the mystery of how Gentiles will be, joint, will be heirs with the Israelites of salvation. And people read that in the Old Testament and wondered, well, how can that be? Well, now through the, no, our knowledge of the Messiah, we know how that took place. Even though it was a concealed prior, it has now been revealed. So through these parables, we're going to be reading the previously concealed truths about the kingdom of God are going to be revealed to us. And I look forward to discovering them <laughs> along with you guys in the following weeks. But, but they aren't revealed to everyone, according to verse 11. Why not? Well, we've got to consider who are the people in who is the audience at this event as Jesus is teaching? Is this a small gathering of his best friends? Hardly. <laughs> at this gathering, this massive gathering of crowds are people who love Jesus, people who hate Jesus, and many people who are still making up their minds about Jesus, who haven't decided if he is a liar, a lunatic, or a lord, as we have conveyed in the past. So, rather than... Jesus rile up these people who have already decided against him and rejected him and would automatically hate and misinterpret everything he says. He communicates in a way that will give those people an excuse to stop listening when the people who are still interested in him will still hear, will still understand what he is saying. That's the point of these parables, so that those who are uninterested would tune out and the people who are interested will continue to tune in and gain further insights into who Jesus is and what the kingdom of heaven is like. Because at the end of the day, when you think about it, the same number of people are actually listening to Jesus when he teaches in parables. Because the people who are his detractors stopped listening to him a long time ago. They were ready to conclude that Jesus is in cahoots with Satan. So that, that shows how much they're actually listening to his parables at this point and his plain teachings, I should say. But this is how he can say to the one who has, more will be given. Because those who truly hear and understand will continue to be deepened in their faith. As part of this sanctification process of the believer, more will be given. But he goes on to say that the one who has not even what he has will be taken away. Where out of their voluntary ignorance and unbelief, they're going to turn from the truth. And whatever little knowledge they currently have of God, you know, it's not going to have any lasting effect in their lives. They're going to end up turning entirely from Jesus. Because look, everyone is either progressing or regressing in their spiritual journey. If you can look back to a spiritual peak in your life, where you're like, that was the moment I at my spiritual peak, that's not a good sign. We should continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Which brings me to a point I've been meaning to come to for a while, but it, 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 it's staring us in the face in this text. Jesus is not interested in crowds for the sake of crowds. He wants disciples, committed followers, not passive crowds. He takes no pleasure in packed out churches of people who are there to attend an event. He wants his church to be gathered of his church, those called by his name. He wants to see doers of the word and not mere hearers only, as the familiar book of James tells us. <laughs> You know, we, we have this tendency to think about the glory days of the church. And when we think of that, we see a picture of this packed out church. Every seat is filled with people. And we think that was the glory days of the church. But that's not necessarily what I see in Scripture. 
It's not when a church is most well attended that describes the glory days. It's when the church is most committed that the church is the strongest and most pleasing to God. When there is a hunger for the word of God, when there's a hunger for prayer, not just here on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week, when there's a hunger to study his word to, and to serve others and to just be together as that called out community that God has called us to be, that is when the church is the strongest. That's the glory days of the church. And of course, there's going to be overlap. There's going to be overlap between crowds and, you know, great moves of the Spirit of God and that hunger that we're talking about. But my point is we can't confuse numbers with an outpouring of the Spirit of God. They're not, there's, there's not a direct correlation there. Because look, I can show you some packed out churches on a Sunday morning, but the Spirit of God has left that place years ago, if it was ever there in the first place. Not to say that big churches are bad and small churches are awesome. That's not the point. It's, that's, that's not what I'm saying. It's whether, the question is whether we hunger and thirst for righteousness. As Jesus himself said just a few chapters ago when we were in the Sermon on the Mount. Does that define who we are here in South Amboy? Do we have that hungering and thirsting for more of God? And does that, maybe even not even a congregational sense, does that define you as an individual? (laughs) Or do we perhaps begrudgingly set our alarms on Saturday night to be here because we have to be here? We, would we accept anything else like that any, in any of the other relationships that are meaningful to us? I mean, imagine, imagine looking at your calendar and you have a date tomorrow night. And you say to yourself, Ugh, do I have to? Do we have to go on this date? Look, we went on a date last month. Now, do we really want to be one of those couples that are together all the time? Come on, let's be practical about this. <laughs> no, we wouldn't accept that in a relationship like that. Why would that apply to our relationship with God? Because let me tell you, when me and my wife sat down last week and we planned out the calendar for this preceding week, and we said, Thursday night's going to be date night, I went, Yes! And I, there was this healthy anticipation all week. You know, the kids are busy, and I'm busy with multiple jobs, and so is she. And to, we have this time to look forward to just enjoy one another's company, to be with each other. You know, not that we're not with each other all the time, but this time is special. Without all the interruptions, to just be together. There was a joy in that, even in the anticipation of waiting for that. Do we have that same anticipation when we consider coming to worship our Lord? Or has that been lost? And look, because if you don't, that says that something, somewhere is wrong. And I'll be honest, sometimes that's on the church side. Sometimes the church is not picking hymns that exalt God. A lot of the new contemporary stuff, not all of it is bad, but some of it is really bad. Uh, there, there are some hymns that are coming, even hymns are coming out that have nothing to do with God. And if that's the case, okay, I understand why you don't have a connection, that anticipation. That makes sense. Or, or preachers, you know, we can forget the centrality of the cross of Christ in our preaching. And if we lose sight of that, we lose sight of Jesus in our preaching, Okay, I understand why you, there's not that anticipation. You're not actually meeting with God when you come here. You're hearing some guy pontificate about politics. It's not what you guys are here today. You guys could have just stayed home and turned on Fox News or CNN or something like that. That's not why you're here. But odds are, if you're in a solid church that cares for those things, if there's a disconnect that, and the church is solid. Well, that only leaves you and God where the connection problem is. And it's not God. 
Often there's a problem in our own hearts that needs to be resolved. There might be some unrepentant sin in our own hearts that we need to take to the cross, that we need to find forgiveness in before we can enjoy that sweet fellowship that we're called to have with our Savior. That's why we start our service with a time of confession, to give you that time to settle your business with God before the service really gets into the meat. So the question we all have to ask is, if we don't have that anticipation, have we left our first love through one way or another? Are we prioritizing other things above God and making idols in our own hearts? Or fearfully, are you one of these people without ears to hear in the first place. As Jesus cites a shocking verse from Isaiah in verse 14, where he says, indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their eyes, they can barely hear. And their eyes have closed, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn that I would heal them. (laughs) By quoting this passage from Isaiah 6, Jesus sees his generation in his day in the first century as a parallel and fulfillment of the nation of Judah during the time of Isaiah, specifically during during the reign of King Ahaz which if you know anything about his reign, he was a wicked king. And his era was categorized as a tide of unbelief. I mean, people at that time were seeming to worship everything but the one true God during that time. So that shows you what the spiritual climate is like during that time of Isaiah. And Jesus is saying, it's the same thing here. Yes, all the people are gathering at the temple to worship, They're gathering in the right place, but their hearts, not so much. And as Jesus was, rather, as Isaiah was commissioned to preach at that time, so was Jesus' mission to Judah in the first century. To preach to a people who wouldn't understand, to who would not seek answers, lest they turn to their Savior and receive that spiritual healing that we've been talking about. But fortunately, not everyone has fallen under this condemnation of being spiritually deaf. As Jesus ends on a good note in verse 16, saying, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. I love this clear distinction between you who hear and they who cannot. And and this is not about who is more intellectually gifted, by the way. It's not about who is better at solving riddles. It's, It's that these parables are spoken for the people of God. And for those people to hear and respond. It reminds me of John 10 verse 27 where Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. It's not that we are so wise and so learned to be able to hear and understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God. No, it's, it's just that we happen to be his sheep and know the sound of his voice. Because many of you guys, as we journey through this chapter together, you guys are going to understand every single thing that I say. But (laughs) yet there are brilliant professors at top universities around the world who will read these same narratives and completely miss the point. I wish I was kidding about that. You know, I, I listen to several political podcasts and There's one that I listen to where they sometimes bring up religion and talk about the Bible. And when that happens, I just want to reach in through my phone and slap these guys. 
because I mean that you got to hear some of the things. They're strange interpretations of these things. I, one recently said that Moses and the Exodus is a commentary on tyranny and whether the desert of freedom is actually better than living under the tyranny of Egypt. I am genuinely scared for that man's eternal destiny. That is a terrifyingly false interpretation of that passage. And that they were so confident in their interpretation that they could proliferate their misguided answer to millions of hearers? That's shocking. That's heartbreaking to me. This person seems completely unable to see the truth right in front of them. Even if they're brilliant in other areas, these people could run circles around me academically, but they seem to miss the, the simplest points. The whole point of these passages, which, by the way, is a regretfully powerful example of what I was talking to you about before. That's what happens when you allegorize the Bible. You end up with weird things like that. But if you are in Christ, if the Holy Spirit dwells within you, you can understand these things that go over the heads of even the most brilliant and learned people in the world today. Jesus even says that the prophets and righteous people throughout the ages would be envious of you. Me? How's that? How's that possible? Because they only heard whispers of this coming Messiah who was to come. And these prophecies that they didn't fully understand, you know his name. You gathered to worship him today in fullness of truth. You're living under the new covenant. The Holy Spirit dwells within you and we have the blessing of having the complete word of God, the completed story of redemptive history all together at once. Guys, it's such a great time to be alive in the sense of being a Christian, folks. To have all of these blessings where even the most learned scholar of the, in the Old Testament times could not understand the Bible as well as it is possible for you. Because you have the clarity of the New Testament to reinterpret or to properly interpret the Old Testament. That now you, you don't need an advanced degree in bibliology, psychology, philosophy, or whatever field to understand the Bible. As a child of God, you just need to pick it up and read it. What a blessing. And many of you will discover this point for yourselves as you take up this challenge that I've been laying down over the past several weeks to join me in reading through the scriptures in one year starting in January. And yeah, many of you guys might not I mean, you certainly won't understand every passage. You're going to write down some question marks in the margins of your Bible, but you'll be surprised at how well you do understand it because of the clarity of Scripture. Because this isn't a cryptic book written to the wise who understand the mysteries and the allegories and create all kinds of strange interpretations like the one I just read from. But this is written to children of God, that prayerfully you are. Thanks be to God. Amen.